and all talk. It tells you a story and makes you want to dance. Steve Fox examines an overnight phenomenon, rapping to the beat. Morning folks, welcome. Welcome to the vlog. So we've just mashed in as you've seen. Um, beer is being made today, but I quickly wanted to touch on uh, a subject related to cleaning. So this morning when I came to work, I'd already set the boil kettle up to start a CIP cycle, which basically means that uh, I fill the tank up the night before we're cleaning products and we set the timer on the control panel to turn on the heating elements for the HLT and at the same time I have the brew pump plugged into the control panel so when it comes to life it turns on the pump and recirculates cleaning products through the tank through a spray ball and the top of the tank and this this white hose uh, and then what we need to do before we put the beer in is we need to sanitize the plate chiller and obviously the sanitation is done by an acid, Persid 5 is what I use it's a paraacetic acid or paraacetic acid uh, and ov obviously we've just caustic the tank so we need to get rid of any remnants of that caustic so what I like to do is fill up with rinse water which is what I'm doing now turn the pump on to recirculate that rinse water around the whole system through all the pipe work and that means shutting off some sections of the pipe work to force the rinse water through the plate chiller and then shutting this piece of pipe work off here to force the rinse water through the spray ball and vice versa we want to also force it through the whirlpool arm and through the, uh, the main supply and once we've done that we'll turn the pump off again and I basically open all the valves like this and we drain that water away but how do I know that we've got rid of all the caustic well there's a trick as we empty the plate chiller we capture we capture a little bit of that wastewater. So I can see here that the water coming out of the plate chiller is at 8.5, 8.6. So how do I know that that is good enough? Well, we just come across to the sink and we'll take a sample of tap water. And we can see that the tap water today is at 7.7. .7. So that means that we're going to have to give the old system another rinse because there's still some residual caustics in there. And once we achieve the same pH out of the plate chiller or any other parts of the pipe work as our rinse water, then we know that we're ready to go ahead and put some acid in to do the sanitation process. So here we go with the final rinse and quite conveniently we're now sitting at 7.7 .7, which is close enough to me so we can go ahead now, there we go 7.7, 7.74, 7.72, that's spot on so now what I'll do is I'll fill up with about 17 to 20 litres of cold water and we'll put in a measured dose of paracetic acid down here using our dose pump and then we'll tip that in recirculate it for five minutes and then we're ready to empty that out and transfer the beer in okay folks well we've come back home I finished the brew day today and uh, also managed to get two more of the bands onto the final tanks or was it three anyway whilst doing that the knee the bursitis in the knee was progressively getting worse now I have to brew again tomorrow 
Uh, but the trouble with the bursitis, also known as carpet fitter's knee, or housewife's knee, or clergyman's knee, there's lots of different names out there for it. And I, of course, I spent a lot of years fitting windows in people's houses and uh, kneeling on solid work surfaces in window reveals, that kind of thing. And I think that's probably where where this ailment's come from. So the only way to sort of fend off a bursitis attack is to stay off your feet and uh, give the affected joint some rest. So I've decided to come home. It's not really early. Uh, I didn't get through the door until quarter past four, but it's pretty early for me. So I've been in the shower and I've decided to uh, start sketching out um, a parts list for the pilot kit at work. Now, I did this while I was sat at work, the HLT. So you'll notice there that, um, if I just touch down a touch, you'll notice that uh, I've, I've already got this one drawn out. So we have the HLT here. We have the Herms coil running round in the centre. We have one three kilowatt heating, heating element, not eating element. We have two valves, obviously the takeoff valve, and then up here is going to be the intake inlet for the uh, recirculation. We have a sight glass so we can measure out into the mash tun. And this little contraption up the top here is a float switch, so um, in fact that wants to be a bit lower down but regardless it wants to be just above the element so the circuit for the PIDs that will be controlling this element will be broken unless this float switch is engaged and uh, if any of you, most of you probably do, follow New to Homebrew Tom uh, there was quite a bit of debate on his channel about what PIDs are required for um, running his elements and the reason we've gone for the low voltage ones which is different to what people normally use is that we can run the signal for the relays uh, for the solid state relays through this float switch and the problem with running 240 volts through these float switches is they don't like any large currents or any large voltage spikes and they tend to either not engage or remain closed. That's the problem I've found with them anyway. So by using the low voltage side uh, like 12 volt then we're reducing the risk of anybody getting a shock from the switches on the panel because they'll all be run at 12 volts and this is only switching very few milliamps at 12 volts and uh, there's less chance of it getting stuck anyway that's covered everything in the HLT that I can think of we've got a thermoprobe here for a PT100 or a K-type thermocouple as you can see on the parts list we've got the SS Brutec kettle 3 kilowatt incloy element the tri-clamp element assembly which is there uh, the Herms coil of course which I believe already has the bulkhead fittings um, stainless steel float switch sight glass assembly which will consist of a bulkhead fitting an elbow I might even incorporate an isolator just in case the sight glass itself develops a leak then we can isolate it down here it might just be something as simple as a thumb valve you know just a little lever valve operated by the thumb or even like an ISO valve that you'll find on lots of plumbing equipment uh, and then we've got the outlet valve, the inlet valve and then we need four half inch BSP camlock type F's which they are the type F's are sort of this shape they have the hex nut and they come up a dish in for where the cam engages and then they come down like that and on the bottom they've got a threaded section that's the type F uh, if you just do a quick Google search you'll find out all the different types of cam lock fitting 
but these are the lowest profile ones to actually go on your element and then you just attach the opposing coupler we'll buy these separately but they will be um, connected onto the hose which kind of looks like this kind of has the arms in there these are the cams of course which engage they normally have big loopy rings on the end and then this side you've got a half inch hose tail barb and of course this section here clips over the top of the f-type I can't remember what these are called though but you get the uh, you get the idea don't you anyway we are waffling on a bit that's the HLT done so what I would like to do now is draw out the mash ton and we'll get everything drawn out so when we order things we'll know exactly what to order I guess so the mash ton comes with a domed lid like such and it has a double insulated wall the mash ton is basically finished for all intents and purposes so the fact that I'm sketching this out is just more a case of verifying in my mind that I have everything I need so we're gonna need a recirc port I think there's one on the top of the mash ton up here uh, and I think it's got a bulkhead fitting in the min in it at the minute but we'll have a look I can't remember so that section there is going to be the recirc inlet with a lever valve and a type F uh, cam lock fitting on there and then on the inside I was thinking about putting some type of rotating spar arm so it would be a piece of copper pipe coming in with a 90 like that and then we'll put like a um, a John Guest T they seem to work best with a couple of spar arms on top like that and then if you get one of these John Guest uh, push fit T's and you remove the o-ring but you leave the metal retaining clips in there they spin they spin freely it's either the John Guest or the screw fix or tool station own brand ones tend to have a bit more slop in the fit so um, they will rotate on their own anyway that's that section uh, we know that there's an outlet on the front we already have that at work that has the uh, lever valve and a type F on there as well we'll just draw it in anyway and that's pretty much all we need for the mash tun it also has a false bottom in there we'll just draw it like that I can't think of anything else that we need to put in the mash tun oh it also has uh, let's do 65 degrees C it has on there an, a thermometer and a, a manometer which is basically two tubes of varying positions one above the grain bed one below and if the liquid level is the same you've not got any suction on your grain bed and there's less chance of a stuck sparge you only get that one on the uh, 20 gallon brew kettle and above I believe though if you're going for the SS Brewtech stuff so the parts list is of course uh, an SS Brewtech mash tun and then we're going to go for uh, sparge arm assembly and then we need two valves uh, 
and two F types. Camlock F type, let's see how much worse my writing got as I carried on to get to the bottom of the page there. So there we go, that is, I think, everything for the mash tun. If I've forgotten something, then I've forgotten something. The hoses and the pumps will do as we uh, put together the brew stand. Okay, and finally, well, not finally, I suppose we've also got the control panel to do, but I might do that on another video to save this one getting too long. Finally, we're going to go for the boil kettle. And we're going to draw him out in much the same way as we drew out the HLT. And we've got the lid that we now comes in and across like that with the handle. So the boil kettle will be housing two incloy element assemblies. It will be housing one, I'll put it in the right position here, one float lever, float level switch. It will have a thermo well for the PID indicator to go into. It will also have an inlet for the whirlpool. Where do we put the inlet? Do we have it up top and then send an arm down? Or we just do we put it mid flow? I think we'll just put it mid flow actually. And with an isolator valve on there. And uh, F type fitting. We're not going to go far wrong with that, I don't think. Then we need the outlet valve. I'll just draw that down here on the front. Again, with an F type fitting on the front of that. So, do we have some type of hop blocker on there? I'm not sure. Maybe we'll come to that as and when. But I know this the uh, the boil kettle comes with a trub dam. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. What I am going to put on the front here is a half inch side glass. So uh, we can actually look at the beer coming out. So the side glass will be after the bore valve or the lever valve but before the hose. Um, yeah so let's just have a flick back onto the HLT see if we've missed anything I don't think we have we don't have that much in the boil kettle to be honest do we thermoprobe whirlpool take off which is down here um, I was tempted to put spray balls in these but I don't think it's going to be required because I'm going to build a sling for the whole thing so that we can just tip tip the whole kettle upside down to dump out the trub and we're going to do the same for the mash tun as well that's going to be built into the brew stand that's something worth tuning in for hit that subscribe button it'll be coming up in a future video very very soon we've already got the steel for the brew stand as well so that is a project that I really want to get off the ground now I've finished the large retrofit to the fermenters at work <clears throat> so let's get a parts list together for the boil kettle. Do I need to have 90 degree elbows on these outlets? Possibly. If I, I suppose if I just order four or five half inch BSP 90s, we can't go wrong, can we? Um, so let's go for two times. Uh, 3 kilowatt incoy 
Oh, we'll see out. Uh, element. Now the reason we're using these incloy elements, they're basically immersion heater elements, but they are made out of stainless steel. That's what the incloy is. And they're readily available, less than 20 quid each from all hardware department stores. Screwfix, Toolstation, B&Q, you name it. Travis Perkins, they've all got it in. And they're all cheap. And the good thing about that is, if you don't have a float switch indicator, a float switch to isolate the elements, so if you turn the power on and the kettle's dry, they're just gonna burn out, right? If you spend 150 quid on one of those fancy S-shaped wavy elements for the boil kettle, and you burn that out, that's somewhat of a bitter pill to swallow. Whereas if you burn one of these little beauties out, ah, it's 15 quid and it down to screw fix. Robert's your mother's brother, bang a new one in, continue brewing. Simples. That's why we've chose to do this. And we've also got the uh, two times um, element. Uh, what did I call it? T-clamp assembly. Because when you need to clean the elements, give them a really good scrub, just undo the tri-clamps, take the element away, put the tri-clamp back on with a blank plate, you can carry on CIPing or cleaning whatever you're doing, and you can take that element away, you can take it to your workbench and or your sink and you can clean it underneath, inside, every little nook and cranny of that element you can get to without exposing it to your cleaning chemicals, meaning it's going to last a heck of a lot longer. That's what I do at work as well, and it works a damn treat. So we need one times thermo well. We need one times float switch. We need two times valves, one times, um, what are they called? They are sight glasses essentially. And uh, two times F-type cam lock fittings. And I think, folks, bingo bango, that's the boil kettle. So there we are, that's it. We're gonna rock off, or rack off, for the day. And, uh, I've been a bit washed out by the light behind me, but never mind. Um, there we are. So, i tell you what you can do. You can tune into tomorrow's vlog, where we are gonna be brewing the proof of concept, the POC, as it's now become affectionately known in the brew shed. And uh, if my knee's any better, we'll be buzzing around as well. Um, maybe drawing up a diagram or a parts list for the control panel. And then, um, yeah, we'll see how we get on. I think it's Friday then, tomorrow. Uh, so join me for that one, folks. I don't want to waffle on too much, so I'm going to bugger off. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Cheers. I know.